Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at two U's fiberadventures.com and we invite you to join our two use fiber adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 projects and I am better in motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the episode. episode. Hi Kelly. Hi Marsha. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's spring break. Yay! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what are you? How are you going to spend your spend your spring break? Well, um, I have spent a little bit of time out in the yard. It's been it's been kind of cool. Um, when it's not raining, it's it's kind of cool. Uh, but mm-hmm. that's made it really easy in between the rain to go out and pull some weeds. So, that's what I've been doing mostly in the yard. So I haven't mm-hmm. had a chance to be out. Um, Yesterday, for a little while, the sun was out, and it was it was just, like, steamy. <laughs> the grass was wet. The sun was warm. I felt mm-hmm. like uh, I ha- felt like the humidity was, like, 85 or 90 percent mm-hmm. because I was sitting, actually sitting <laughs> on the grass. Mm-hmm. So that's what I've been doing, a little bit of weeding. I had to go okay. into work and do some grading one mm-hmm. day, and I've been doing some knitting. So okay, not a whole lot of of uh, playing, but you know the kind of thing I use like to do during spring break mm-hmm. is spend a lot of time outside, and I haven't been doing that. But that's all right. I've gotten other things done. So well, and um, I I hear that you have some playing happening on Thursday. Yes. So uh, yeah, we're going to San Francisco, um, and we're going to go see Hamilton. Yeah, well, I this I think this I I think I get some of the responsibility for this because <laughs> <laughs> I we we didn't talk about this. I don't think we talked about this in the last episode, but um, I went with my friend Kim for her birthday. We went to San Francisco. We were there uh, not this week past weekend, but the weekend before. We flew down for her birthday. This was her celebration, what she wanted to do, and we saw Hamilton. And I know, and I remember sitting in the theater thinking to myself. Why am I here? Robert should be here because <laughs> he loves the all. Well, he read the the A- Alexander Hamilton's biography uh, by Chernoff. Chernoff, isn't it? Mm-hmm. He, you said he's read that twice before they even made the musical. Yeah, and um, and he's and, now uh, listening because we're going. He's he has the CDs, mm-hmm. and so he's got them in the car. And I I forget what year he said he was up to today. He's been listening to it. And we've listened to, he's, he's put it on while I've been in the car, not recently, but mm. another trip we were on, he had it on, and we were listening to it. So yeah, he's a, he's a big Hamilton fan. Mm-hmm. So I'm really glad you guys are going to go see it. Yeah. It's, it's uh, I, I thought, you know how like there's so much hype about this musical that I thought, God, is it really going to live up to the hype? Mm-hmm. And I have to say, I really did enjoy it. I thought it was very, very good. And... I don't want to say too much, but I mean, you have heard the soundtrack and everything, but, um, uh, well, and I, I know a little struck- about his story <laughs> just yeah, from listening yeah. to Robert. <laughs> I know many, many years of, <laughs> him but what I was going to, I, I didn't really know what to expect. I knew that it's all sort of rap music. I, I knew that, um, but I didn't really know what to expect. And what I, the only thing I would say is that I know Lin-Manuel Miranda has seen musicals before, but it's almost like they told him go write a musical and he had never seen a musical before Mm, mm -hmm. because it doesn't start out the way you think of most musicals with the overture where you get a snippet of every song that's going to come and then it uh um there's no curtain it just starts um and not to give too much away but you it doesn't like most musicals end with uh everybody out on stage and it's a big dance number Mm -hmm. and it's all very uplifting and upbeat and it's not that way at all at the end it's um it, so it's almost like Lin Manuel Miranda was asked to write a musical, but he didn't even know what a musical was. So he just came <laughs> up with this idea, and it really is fantastic, very very enjoyable. And and um, yeah, I, the first act is like an hour and fifteen minutes, and it felt like it was about fifteen minutes. Wow! 
So it's 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 fun. It, it really was very enjoyable. So I think you're going to have a good time. Yeah, I'm looking forward to so, it. I'm yeah. I'm also looking forward to being able to sleep <laughs> in a hotel room past 4 a.m. <laughs> yes, no dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No dogs on this trip. Mm-hmm. So and and we'll have some time in the city on on Thursday because we're going early. So we'll be in the city before we can before we can check in. So mm-hmm. we'll have some time, and then um, Thursday night is the performance, and then Friday we have some time too. So his, you know, he's off all day, and so we're not going to rush home mm-hmm. in the morning. As soon as we check out, we'll probably nice. play a little bit in San Francisco. Nice. So yeah, that'll be fun. It'll be fun. Yeah, It'll be really fun. Anyway. Okay. So, should we just do a quick update on projects then? Sure. All right. Do you want to go? Yeah, I will. I don't have a lot okay. to talk about. Um, but well, I, I don't either. So <laughs> we we sort of have a theme the last few episodes. We need to get we need to get some like major inspiration going, Marsha. Yeah. Well, it's not that I'm not inspired, but it kind of is like I'm not inspired. But anyway, I'm working on my Karoo by Rohanitz, mm-hmm. which I really like. This this is, but it's just this is a long term project. It's on size three needles. And it's a cardigan. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I have nine, let's see. I think I have almost 1,400 yards mm-hmm. of yarn. So, you know, this is this is a long project. I did get the piece ripped out that I needed to rip out from when I was going, doing the charts backwards. Well, I had mixed them up, uh, mixed up the, the charts and was doing the left on the right and the right on the left. Mm-hmm. And suddenly everything was going the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. I pulled that out probably toward the beginning of break, maybe Monday. Let me just say, we all know it's good to alternate skeins, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But what a pain <laughs> to rip out <laughs> when you alternate skeins. And then, yes. and then, you know, I had these nice cakes of yarn, and they're not wool. It's not wool. It's silk. So the mm-hmm. cakes are a little more fragile because there's not as much stretch, right? Right. It's like maybe I should have wound, hand wound them into balls. I don't know. I did not. But then I had these, you know, all this yarn that I had to wind around the cakes the wrong way so that it could come off nicely. Anyway, it's, it's all fixed now. The pain of ripping out and mm-hmm. rewinding and finding my place is all over. And I've, I've gotten back to the yarn I haven't used before, so I'm... My, oh, my cakes good. of yarn You're are making... all back to the, the way they should be. I haven't put them back into the knitting bag that I like to use, the, the one from Nan, Totten Front Range Bags, mm-hmm. that has the two little yarn guides. I haven't mm-hmm. put them back in there yet, but I'm going to have to because if they're just kind of bumping around in the bottom of a bag, not sitting firmly with their little mm-hmm. strings, they're not going to make it because okay. they're... You know, like they're they're not wool, and so yeah, it's a little more. They're a little more fragile. But I've been going, and I've got oh, I don't know, maybe eight inches. Wow, pretty nine good. Nine inches, something like that. One, two, three, four, five repeats of the pattern. So mm-hmm. I really like the color, kind of a deep blue with almost blue black sections. Mhm. Mhm. So. It's good that I'm alternating skeins. I can tell by looking at it that it's a good thing I'm alternating skeins. So that's good. You always, you know, you want to at least feel like the pain is worth it. Mm-hmm. So, but the patterns, the the lace part of it is beautiful. The traveling stitches and holes. It's really, it's really a nice. Well, I, what, the, the, what you were working on at stitches I thought was really pretty, mm-hmm. that pattern. Yeah. yeah, the patterning is really nice. She has a cowl. I can't remember the name of the cowl now, but um, if you look up Aroha Knits, she has a cowl that's fairly recently published that has a very similar lace pattern with the twisted mm-hmm. stitches, the sort of traveling twisted stitches. Mm-hmm. So the yarn I'm using um, to remind people is Dragonfly Fibers Dance Rustic Silk. I really like this yarn. I have a top, my Savannah, no, Havana top is made out of this yarn. 
and I really like it. Yeah. So I think I'll get a lot of use out of the sweater when it's when it's done. So yeah, that's my project. And then I did finish something. Okay. So I mentioned last time that I had taken up the challenge of finishing a project from uh, Spirit Yarn from the mm -hmm. Knockers D Stash Room. Mm -hmm. And so I started making hats. I had four skeins, a whole bag of Karen Simply Soft acrylic yarn in a variegated gray with um, strands of pink, yellow, green, blue going mm -hmm. through it. And out of the four balls, I made five hats. Wow, nice. Yeah, and I've got a, a ball of yarn left that's about a little bit bigger than a walnut. Okay. So I used I used almost all of it. Nice. Yeah. Are you going to bring that little ball back to the pistache <laughs> room? <laughs> no, I think I'm going to throw it away. <laughs> uh, tie up tomatoes. With it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm done with that yarn, so that feels good. I got mm -hmm. I used something from from pistache, and I may grab another because we've still got a little bit of time. Not a lot of time, but we still got a little bit of time. I may grab another, another something else from from my spirit yarn to to work on. That was kind of fun. So, Marsha, that's what I've been working on. What have you been working on? Well, I finished my pullover mountain high. Oh yeah. Do you remember I've been I've been working on that, and I mm -hmm. finally finished it, and I love the sweater. It's my new favorite sweater. This is, um, of course. Uh, <laughs> Every episode I laugh about this, Heidi Kermeyer, <laughs> uh, my go-to person, but it's it fits really well, and I love the yarn. So the yarn I'm using is the, the Croft Shetland Tweed by uh, West Yorkshire Spinners, and it's the one that I bought in Glasgow at the Yarn Cake. And it's Shetland, and I you know most of the Shetland, I feel, is the Jameson, mm -hmm. which I don't know that you'd want to wear that against your skin. This is very soft. In fact, I, I'm recording wearing it, and I just have a t-shirt on underneath. And I, like my arms, it feels totally fine against my arms. It's not itchy or scratchy at all. Mm -hmm. um, very comfortable. I think there's a lot um, of Shetland that is um, softer or, I don't know if soft is the right adjective, maybe silky. Mm -hmm. Is it is it kind of silky, the yarn? Yeah, Cause the it does feel Shetland, that way. The Shetland um, that I use to make those uh, boot toppers you know mm -hmm. the Shetland that we well we have still have some in the shop, but that Shetland yeah. that's that that we had uh, milled, I thought was really really silky feeling, mm -hmm. kind of surprisingly um, soft. I mean it it kind of comes across as soft, but also a really silky not soft like merino, but a mm -hmm. silky kind of soft. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I you know that I do remember when I took mm, a couple of years ago there was a, a class at Fiber Fusion and with Judith McKenzie and it was talking about how, um, um, I don't want to say sort, but how to break apart a fleece. Mm -hmm. And she used the, and it was a, a Shetland fleece and she was talking about how the fiber is different depending on where it is on the sheep. And some of it, you know, is um, more coarse, I guess, that you'd want it on a sweater that mm -hmm. you would wear like you know, something wear. underneath the sweater outerwear and then some of it is so soft and fine and as you say silky that you could spin it and wear and knit underwear out of it <laughs> so I would say my sweater is somewhere on that spectrum <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's very comfortable and I and I also I modified the sweater only in that I added more stitches because I I made the size it, it has two size mediums medium one and medium two I made medium two mm -hmm. um and I think it was the bust was 42. I wanted 40. I wanted four inches of positive ease, so I added two inches. I think I talked about this in yeah. past episodes, but I followed the Amy Herzog method of putting increases on the front, not on the back, or not on the side stitches, but about, I would say, probably four inches in fr towards the front mm -hmm. of the sweater from the side seam, and I put in uh, four increases, so that made it was eight stitches which equal two inches, and it fits beautifully. I really recommend that technique. Well, that's good. Um, and I've had, and it's, it's very comfortable, and I love the color, and I love, I love everything about it. 
So, um, and then the only other thing, I, well, I have a lot of things I'm working on, like my rabbit, my Claire Garland rabbit, mm-hmm. but I've not picked it up. But I am determined to finish it before Knockers because there's been a request that I bring it to Knockers and show everybody. So his, his little body's done. I just have to sit down and sew him up and stuff him and then knit the hind legs and attach those. Um, and But I have to get that done before uh, 5 a.m., <laughs> Um, April <laughs> April 10th when I head to the air I have to be at the airport at 5 a.m. so uh, yeah, to catch my flight to come down and you could do on the plane on your way <laughs> no no I as I have to I have to get that done so I'm hoping tonight or tomorrow um, uh, to finish him up you know stuff him mm-hmm. in the way. and then I've been working on just a pair of vanilla socks and I finished the first pair and cast on and I've done maybe four inches of the leg of the second one and it's the um the yarn is from a a indie dyer in Aberdeen Washington called Little Fish Little Fish Stitches and the colorway is Happy Go Lucky and it's just bright hot pink and yellow and green really bright oh these are the ones that you uh that you started when you were tired of blue, right? Just plain blue. I was tired of I was tired of all the the. the it seemed like I'd been knitting everything in the same color, so I needed everything was kind of beige. I think I was doing. I don't okay. know blue and beige. Yeah. I don't know. I needed something yeah, different. I remember so. you saying you needed some color. The other thing I've been working on is trying to find. I finished the swatch of um, the DK weight yarn from New Lanark Mills, mm-hmm. uh, and then I I'm looking for a sweater for my brother. And I've done the swatch, but we're having a little bit of a difficulty finding a sweater that we all agree upon. <laughs> Everybody can read between the lines about that statement. <laughs> right. Well, it, well and, and Kelly and I, we, you and I did have a little bit of a conversation before we started recording. And just this notion of neither one of us have really knit for other people. And when you knit for other people, um, sometimes if they don't knit, they don't understand that you can't make that sweater because it's the wrong that what they have fallen in love with is not the the yarn that you have it's so mm-hmm. you um it's difficult sometimes you know if they have a bulky weight sweater and you have a dk yarn sometimes it's difficult to make that transition to make a different yeah. or the sweater that my brother has completely fallen in love with doesn't exist as a pattern it's a commercial sweater so um <laughs> Uh, I, I, there's no pattern out there. I can't do it. I mean, right. Well, I guess never say never. I guess I could, but I don't want to uh, try. And I, I don't have that skill level to create a pattern from something I see in the right. yeah. store. Yeah. It's not. So um, we've been sort of, um, uh, as only brothers and sisters can, been kind of going at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the rule is that if you're going to make something for someone else, you don't ask them what they want. You just make what you want to make. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, and also the other thing I would say, you have to listen to what the yarn is telling you. Mm -hmm. And this yarn is not telling me that it wants to be a cabled sweater. Right. It just wants to be a plain stockinette sweater. I don't think it's... Well, didn't you say uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a woolen spun? It's like a woolen spun and I don't think that's that's going to work in cables. It's not a good match of yarn and, yarn and pattern for sure. Yeah. 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 So we are continuing our conversation. (laughs) But anyway, what I'm doing right now is I'm just swatching. Um, I had bought, I had mentioned this before in the podcast, but in the sale bin at uh, a yarn shop here in Seattle, I bought six skeins of Imperial Stock Ranch um, Columbia, Mm -hmm. which is a worsted weight uh, woolen spun. And uh, it's in kind of a, the color is juniper green, kind of a pine color. So I'm just sitting here swatching um, with that to make myself something. I don't know what. Um, this, it's just swatching is nice, easy knitting while you record. Yeah. Well, and I need to think of some, some. I mean, thinking about being inspired for the next project, I need to think mm-hmm. of something that's going to be nice, easy knitting for the retreat. Yes. And it would be nice if it was something a little bit big. I mean, like, socks are nice, easy knitting, but... I don't know. It's kind of more fun to be working on something that that people say, "Oh, what are you knitting?" And it's not just, "Oh, a yeah. sock," "Oh, a yeah. bear," yeah, yeah. <laughs> a mother bear, <laughs> a sock, yeah. a hat. I'm kind of in the same thing as I I 
I have a, I also have a shawl I've been, well, I pick it up periodically that is just all um, garter stitch until mm-hmm. you get the end where you do some lace. And so I'm sort of holding off working on that too much because that would be a good thing oh, yeah. to take to knockers because it's just the garter stitch. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking about that, I was also thinking, well, if I like this uh, Imperial stock ranch, if I like the swatch and I, I, there's a pattern I've been sort of looking at, I might cast on and knit on that at the, mm-hmm. uh, at the retreat. I, I, you know, you're talking about not really having any inspiration. I have a lot of ideas. I mean, there's a lot of things I want to make. I, when we were at Stitches, I bought linen to make a t-shirt. I really want to cast on for that. But I was thinking part of the reason I've not even done the swatch is the, the linen, the skeins you have to wind into balls. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the mm-hmm. class we had? And, yeah. um, I, the thought of having to hand wind those all into balls um, is a little daunting. And what I did last time is I wound them onto toilet paper tubes. Oh, uh huh. Do you remember that whole discussion? Yeah, I tape yeah. Our listener had suggested you just tape the toilet paper tube to the, and I did that and it worked pretty well. And then I just put athletic socks over them to keep yeah, it in place. That's what I but, used. I used one of those uh, yarn cozies. Yeah. So I, 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 that would be, I would like to get going on that. And that would be another good thing that, to, yeah, to that knit would on be at the retreat. Yeah, that would be a good project. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I've got time. But I have all these ideas. Well, and, and, and the other thing that would be kind of fun, except it's a whole bunch of little pieces and might not be good retreat knit, knitting, is the skull. Yes. That might not be good. It, it, it's not said, hard not, yeah, knitting. No. It doesn't look like it's, looking at the pattern, it doesn't look like it's difficult knitting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it does look like a lot of, I mean, I do know it's a lot of pieces that you have to keep track of. So It's a lot of sure pieces you have to keep good. track of, and you have to make sure that you mark the pieces mm-hmm. correctly. And mm-hmm. yeah, So I don't think that would be good re- retreat no. knitting. I did think about if I could get that knit before I came down to visit you, you have a top-load washing machine. Yeah. And I don't know any, I, everybody I know here has a front load. Oh. So yeah. I need to, I need somebody with a top load that I can throw it, you know, throw it in to wash it. Mm-hmm. So, or I'm going to have to go to the laundromat. But, uh Anyway, um, but yeah, no, I, there's a couple of things I've been thinking of and actually, um, yeah. So I don't know. I have ideas, but, uh, well, and I've been looking for a pattern for a sweater to use that. I have a three ply CVM yarn mm -hmm. and originally when I saw Carew, I was looking for a pattern for that yarn and then I saw Carew and I liked the, the stitch detail but I knew that it's a wool and spun yarn too. It's my hand spun. And I knew that it wouldn't do the stitch pattern justice. Mm-hmm. And so so that's when I thought of using the, the dance rustic silk for this sweater. But I'd really like to get started on that sweater. And I think it's come down to, I've really, I've looked at a lot of other sweaters, but the sweater I wear the most is the Funky Grandpa. Mm -hmm. And it's the same style of yarn as the funky grandpa that I have. And so I think I might just make that style of sweater, just make it without the stripes. Mm -hmm. And, and I think I'll make the, I think I will make a little bit smaller size. I have quite a bit of positive ease in the one that I made. I think I'll make it just slightly smaller, Mm -hmm. but it feels sort of boring. Like, not not like it will be boring to make the sweater. It feels like I'm being boring to make the same sweater again. You know, like I could mm. I could branch out and try someone else's pattern and but but I know that I know that I like the fit of it. I know that I mm-hmm. like how easy it is to wear. I know mm-hmm. I get a lot of use out of it. It's a practical choice, I guess. Is the, yeah. the when I say boring, it's it's like it's the practical choice is to make something that I know is a style that goes with what I usually wear. I'll get a lot of use out of it. Um, I know it'll work with the yarn I have. The gauge is right. You know, all of that. So mm-hmm. so maybe I'll... Maybe I'll. Um, and maybe it's not the boring choice. It's the smart choice. Well, <laughs> it's the responsible the, choice. <laughs> the re- well, okay, I guess that you're right. That is the boring choice. Well, or it's just the, it, the, it's the yarn is telling you what it wants yeah, to be. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, that's true. It's true. I think that is the case. And one of the reasons, honestly, one of the reasons that I've, that I've resisted is that 
the funky grandpa has this interesting shoulder detail mm -hmm. and I did the shoulder detail for the gray one in the pattern original pattern it's black you know mm -hmm. it's, it's a contrasting color mm -hmm. the shoulder little tab yeah and mm -hmm. mine's just gray it's the same color as the sleeve so you can't even see it and it was super mm -hmm. fiddly it's like okay mm -hmm. I need to do that same thing again for no, <laughs> no good reason. So it's like, ah, oh, can't I find another pattern? But yeah, but I do like this one. So I, I really should be boring and responsible and yeah, choose that one instead of trying something new. I think with this particular yarn, I thought of something I forgot to say about my uh, mountain high pullover. Uh -huh. I had. Uh, probably a half inch, in half inch in diameter ball of yarn left over. Oh, I remember seeing that on Instagram. And I, oh my now God. I was, I was, um, I was not in too much of a panic because the truth is I had two skeins left over. Oh. <laughs> I had two, I have two extra skeins, but I, you know, it's one of those things I did not want to break into one of those skeins because mm -hmm. I thought I could either, you know, give them to somebody or sell them to somebody or I could make something else. But just the idea, I, mostly it was just the idea I didn't want to break into another skein for just like two yards. Right. It was like, I just wanted to make this thing and it, and it worked. I was, but I, I did have to, I ripped out my swatch to make it work. Um, <laughs> But, and I, I was getting, I was like, kind of like, uh, I was actually kind of sweating there a little bit at the end because like, oh my God, is it going to be enough? I was just worried, but it worked out. Yeah. About a half inch ball. Oh. So, I, and, you, and then I had the other two skeins. Yeah. And you have your sleeves the length you want and. Yeah. Nice. I, I recommend the pattern, but anyway, and then that yarn, I recommend that yarn too. Yeah. I, okay. when I, when you first showed me the pattern, I was kind of like, okay, that's nice. But I wasn't, it didn't like sing to me or anything. Not like, oh, you have mm -hmm. to make this. And I don't really wear pullovers. Um, mm -hmm. But then I saw the picture in your project page of the finished sweater. I was like, oh, that's really good looking. Well, I'm, I will say too, Kelly, that I don't think <laughs> like you're saying about your choice being boring. Sometimes I just want to be able to wear my sweaters. And I've made sweaters that are you know, unusual designs. And then I don't really wear them that much. Mm -hmm. And isn't the whole point is to wear your stuff? Yeah. So yeah. if it's like, if it's the, it's the sweater, like, uh, I don't know, because I have to fiddle with it. Um, okay. I would, not to name names, but I'm just going to say the, that swirl sweater that we both made. <laughs> yeah. I never wear mine. <laughs> I honestly, I don't think I've ever worn it <laughs> because it's not really comfortable because when you put it on, you have to do all this fiddling with it. Yeah. And um, so like this sweater that I just finished is very much a just throw on, don't think about it. And um, some of the other sweaters I've made recently are just throw on, don't think about it. Yeah, my, so there's my two best sweaters, well, my couch and sweater, the, the Orca Run, mm -hmm. is a great sweater, except the zipper, I had to, like, hand bind the top mm -hmm. of the zipper. And mm -hmm. sometime back in December, I went to zip it up and zip the zipper tab right off the zipper. So... I have to get a new zipper mm -hmm. for that one. That one's pretty easy to wear. The Funky Grandpa is great, super easy to wear. The other one that I really love is the Cherry Vanilla. That mm -hmm. one that's the cotton and linen and silk, three mm -hmm. strands, that purple one. I love that sweater. I wear that all the time. It yeah. in more, more in the spring and summer than in the winter, of course, but... But yeah, that sweater gets a lot of wear. So, so yeah, I need to make something that that I know I'm going to get a lot of wear out of. I don't get much wear out of the out of the swirl sweater. Yeah. And then yeah, what else do I? I guess that's. I don't think I have. Oh, and then I have the other linen sweater, the featherweight. I have two featherweights, and those are harder to wear. Mm hmm. I have to. The, the sleeves are tight on one, so if I take it off and put it back on, I have to really readjust the sleeves, you know, with a, something underneath it. Or I have to wear it with just a, uh, it's a good spring sweater because mm -hmm. I can wear it with just a shell underneath and not have to worry about sleeves under sleeves. Mm -hmm. But I want a sweater that I can wear over a long sleeve t-shirt. That's, I mean, that's what's practical. 
So that doesn't that doesn't sound boring because it sounds like it's a challenge to, to find that sweater. <laughs> and you have found that I sweater. found it. Yeah, that's true. So just make it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next time um, you see me, maybe I will have cast on. Yeah, yeah. And gotten past right. the fiddly part. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it'll be another sweater on size three needles. That's the other thing. <laughs> Uh, well, you may, you may want to. Uh, hmm. I don't know, but you know, I, you you normally do knit things on smaller needles. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You don't really. And it's like, not I'm, like I'm going to need to wear it anytime soon. I have enough other things to wear, so. Yeah, like I'm swatching on eight, and I was thinking I'm normally knitting with well socks, which is I think I've got, I think they're twos. I don't remember what size those needles are. And shawls are usually three to fives, and sweaters are sixes usually. Mm-hmm. So I don't do very many that are on size eight needles. Okay, what's next? Are we done with projects? We are. That's all we have. Let's move on. We managed to talk a long time about not a lot of knitting. <laughs> well, that's what we do, Kelly. We talk a lot about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh. Oh, gosh. Well, we, have, we do have something to talk about because we had a question in the threads a while back from a listener, Mom Diggity, Joanne, and she was asking, she says, I would love to hear you talk about your fiber dyeing techniques. Also, I want Marsha to explain how she splits up her fiber braids for her compost bin. So you talked about that already. We answered that part mm-hmm. of the question, but we said we would talk about dyeing another time. So I was thinking about the techniques that I use, and one of the things that I have used for a really long time has to do with putting colors together. Mm-hmm. I like blending the dye colors. Like if I want a green, I most often don't just get a green dye and use that green dye. More often I'll either, I might use the green and then use some other dye color along with it to kind of change it into some other kind of green, or I might use a blue and a yellow Um, I might take a green that I already have and put in a tiny bit of red to make it more sort of dull, uh, more interesting. Once I do that and I, you know, sort of think about what color, what color I want and what colors I'm going to use for it, then if I wanted a contrast color or if I wanted to do sort of a variegated, I would also use one of those colors. So, for example, I don't think I'm making sense. (laughs) (laughs) so let's say I made a green from a blue Mm -hmm. and a yellow and then Mm -hmm. a little bit of maybe I put in a little bit of orange just to kind of blue yellow a little bit of orange to make it kind of a warmer green Mm -hmm. so then if I wanted an orange to go with that green I know that orange that I used would work Mm -hmm. because it was part of what I used to make the green Mm-hmm. Or if I wanted the green to be with a blue, I could use the blue that was sort of the parent of that green. And I know that right. it will work because that blue is in that green already. Right. Or if I wanted a purple, I would start with that same blue and then add a little bit of red to make the purple. I wouldn't just grab a purple off the shelf. Right. And add something so, totally new to the mix. So limiting myself to the to a group of colors and then making colors to that go together from that group of colors pretty much mm-hmm. guarantees that you get things that go together well. Yeah, it makes sense because you're using that base blue. The mm-hmm. um, You're not introducing... Um, because there's cool blues and warm blues, right. right? So if you have a cool blue, you're not now going to dye something with a warm blue. Right. You're always starting with that cool blue. And I guess maybe that's... I mean, maybe you can make things that don't go together well, but you avoid the mistake. You avoid some of the mistakes that you might make if you, let's say you were new to choosing colors and you weren't really thinking about warm and cool. You were just thinking about colors. You avoid some of those mistakes. Mm-hmm. It kind of is. It's a nice guide, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it and it's kind of fun to to play with what with a limited palette and see what you can make out of that palette that you mix together. And then, of course, 
I mean, then, then, and then there's the not purposefully mixing them at all, but just a kettle dye. And I like that a lot too. I have a crock pot, like after dinner, I'd put a bunch of wool in the crock pot and pour different colors of dye in and then, you know, have it be on and then turn it off when I went to bed and in the morning it would mm-hmm. be colored wool. That was really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the colors combine in ways that you don't expect. And so that's mm-hmm. kind of a fun thing to do, too. But it's a lot less intentional than what I was talking yeah. about before. I was going to talk about um, just the techniques I've tried. I've done the painting where you just lay out your yarn in a like a one of those aluminum foil roasting pans or on foil or something mm-hmm. and just paint the color on it randomly. Or, yeah, I've tried that. Or like um, in stripes. I, in stripes, mm-hmm. yeah. I've tried, well, the kettle dyeing. We've tried that together. Or is that what you call it when we did the, the dye, the teal? Which, that's kettle dyeing. Yeah. When you try to get mm-hmm. the uniform color all over. Mm-hmm. When you can use different colors when you kettle dye, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, we tried the technique where you just put the wet yarn in a mason jar with mm-hmm. water and pour the dye over it. Yeah, that's I like interesting. To do that. And you know where you twist the yarn and then put it in there, pour the dye over it, take it out, retwist it another direction, pour another and color of another dye color, over it. Yeah, that's really interesting technique. Yeah, I do that a lot. I've tried. Do you remember Kelly? I made the the self <laughs> quote unquote self striping yarn. Do you remember? Mm-hmm. And I made a shawl mm-hmm. out of it, uh, where I had to figure out how to wind, and I. <laughs> it, yeah, that was, and I, there's a whole podcast where you, a couple of years ago where I talk about that, but that was a very complicated thing and uh, super fun, but a little complicated how I did it. And so uh, I'm going to get back to that in a second. What else have I tried? Um, well, I've dyed fiber mm-hmm. before spinning. Like that technique, that's kind of fun too. The other thing I really like though is over dyeing. And we've done this together, Kelly, you know, the idea that like you take. Uh, and you put you paint the dyes on any way you, you end up with your dyed yarn whether you paint it on however you do it you end up with your dyed yarn I like it when there's sometimes some little uh, white bits and then you take that dyed yarn and you over dye it in a very very mild solution of a color like navy or we tr- mm-hmm. like I tried navy tried black um, but you could pick any color yeah red green you like so it's very very uh, diluted solution of that and it has an interesting uh, way of sort of softening all the colors. Well, the colors change because they aren't that pure color that they were before because now they have another color uh, attaching to it, but in a much more muted way. Yeah. And um, so it's, a, it's sometimes it's an interesting technique. If you look at your yarn, and you think, oh, it's just so contrasty. Not that that's really a word, contrasty, but there's too much contrast and uh, sharpness with all those colors. This is a nice way just to bring it down and tone it and sort of soften it and make it all blend together a little bit mm-hmm. because now all the colors have that um, one color attaching to it. Yeah. Um, kind of an interesting technique. Yeah. Well, and then I'll add to that the opposite of that, which I've been doing some of recently, is mm-hmm. to dye a yarn in a pale color. Mm-hmm. And so you have, you have you know, uh, several skeins of the same pale color, and then you can do different things with them, and they'll all complement one another. So you yeah. could take one of them and and just leave it the pale color. You could speckle it. You could paint some other color on top of it. You could yeah. twist it and over dye it with something else, and then you have some bits, you know, in the the twisted bits you have some parts that are that are that pale color and then you've got another color over the top Mm -hmm. and and the colors again will go together like the the shawl that I just recently made the mystery knit along shawl the green that spruce green redwood green that's in the shawl is green over the top of brown Mm -hmm. and the first green that I had was was not right and then I realized, oh, because the, because what I had previously done was green over the top of brown, mm-hmm. and I had kind of forgotten because it was it was it had been a little while. And then so I added some of the brown to the green, and then, and then they matched much better. The green went with the brown much better than it had before. So so you can, so you can add a color over the top, or you can start with a like add a light 
wash of a dark color over the top of something, or you can start with a light wash of a pale color mm-hmm. and dye over that. Mm-hmm. And both of those things are, are, it's interesting, they're different. Mm-hmm. You come up with different results, but they're really pretty. Yeah, so I'm trying to think other techniques that I've tried. Um, I'm interested, Kelly, when you've been talking about that, doing the sort of the the light color and then dyeing over the light color. I'm interested in trying that. I should say, also, I've only used the acid dyes. Um, I've never used natural dyes. Um, I've always been sort of leery of the mordant that you need to to make it mm-hmm. set. And so I, I am kind of interested in looking, taking a class on that because I've not... I've kind of stayed away from the natural dyes, but um. I've done some natural dyeing, and I've mostly used um, alum mm-hmm. as a mordant, which is a that's a pretty safe one. Okay, and you just like the same thing you use to make pickles. Oh, okay, pickling, pickle. I just used pickling alum. Okay. That worked really well. I've had experience with natural dyes, and trying all kinds of different things, trying some recipes. Um, and and some th- things are disappointing in natural dyes because you, you know, this the pH of your mm-hmm. of your dye solution that makes a big difference. Or if you heat something too high, then you don't get the color you were hoping for. Certain colors can't mm-hmm. take take the high heat, and so you know, just as sort of grabbing plants from the backyard and experimenting, it can be a little bit disappointing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so taking a class is a good idea because yeah. because you got the knowledge of the person teaching to know, okay, wait, this particular color, you can get it if you don't have your dye bath go above this temperature or mm-hmm. this particular color, you can get it if you keep your pH in this range. But once you get out of this range, you lose the color. Mm-hmm. I once fermented lupin blossoms for like a week. I followed this recipe, fermented lupin blossoms. <laughs> uh, and it was the most beautiful, beautiful red, but it didn't, it didn't stay in the dye bath. I think it maybe the dye bath got a little bit too, too hot. Or so what color did the yarn turn out? Yellow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I remember we, years Everything ago when we talked about the... yellow, really. I mean, yeah. if you just ran, if you just take, and it wasn't supposed to come out yellow. It was supposed, I was, I. I don't think I was supposed to get red. That's a pretty hard one to get. I can't remember now what it was supposed to be, what I was hoping for. I honestly I can't remember. But but yeah, I, it was it was a it was a like neon highlighter yellow <laughs> that it that it came out. And that's a very common color from natural dyes. Mhm. Unless you unless you um, use different mordants or unless you're really careful about temperature or in ca- unless you have a, a particular dye that you know gives you something else. Mm-hmm. So Also on the, the subject, too, about taking a class is there's on Craftsy, and I know everybody sees Craftsy, so this may not be new to people, but um, there are two classes, and I, I've not taken them, but I think I might take them because I know I know something about dye, but I she does cover things that I've not done before. So anyway, there's two classes. They're both taught by Sarah Eyre, and that's E-Y-R-E. The first one is called Professional Yarn Dyeing at Home, and the, she covers dyeing solids, semi-solids, speckles, uh, and variegated. And she, just, she also is in the... Um, uh, syllabus says she's going to discuss yarns, the different dyes, Morden's safety, which is important, yeah. the gear, and setting up a studio, which, mm-hmm. honestly, most of it's just in our kitchen, but um, how to set that up. So that's, I think it would be a, a good uh, class to take. And then her other one is Next Steps in Dying. And in that, she discusses, um, shows how to make gradients, how to dye sock blanks, how to make self-striping yarn, and then hand painted yarn, and then also dyeing fibers in uh, for uh, not fibers, dyeing fiber for uh, spinning. So that's those both look like really good classes. Um, and then also, I just there I was trying to remember the name of a book that I got Kelly. I bought it years ago at the bookstore here in Seattle. Um, it was all it was, a, but I can't remember the name of it. So I just went and I looked on um, Amazon, and there's a lot of books about. Uh, dying. So that would be the other thing is people who are interested in dying, uh, 
check out Amazon. There's tons of books out there on it. Yeah. Um, but if you're a learner like me that I do better um, watching somebody do it, I, those those craftsy classes I think would be really good. And, um, and honestly, I think a lot of the learning is just try it, experiment. Mm-hmm. Uh, think get of your things. hands dirty. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, wear gloves. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, and the, I would. I'm just going to say the one thing I noticed that I watched the preview for both of these um, classes on Craftsy, and she does not wear gloves. Her so her hands are completely stained, and it it is hard to get it out of your hands off your. And well, and it's just, not. It's I, I don't. It's think, not safe. I think you I need to have your hands. Good. Yeah. 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 You need to wear latex gloves. I mean, the so, worst. Um, the the worst thing is is breathing the dye powder. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the thing that that I think people don't realize that they need to be careful about. Um, But you shouldn't have your hands in the dye without gloves. No, no. Especially not if you're going to do a lot of it. I mean, if you just one-time dye yarn, nothing's going to happen to you if you put your hands in the dye pot, except you're going to get dyed hands that are hard to get clean. But I don't think it's necessarily super unsafe but the cumulative effect if you're going to be doing a lot of it is yeah you you need to be safe well what i would say is if you're supposed to have separate pots Mm -hmm. so once you use a pot for dyeing you never use it for eating right why would you put your hands in it and then right cook with your hands i mean yeah yeah. (laughs) so wear gloves that would be the only thing i would say wear gloves Wear gloves and Um, use a mask yeah when you're when especially when you're have the dye, uh, the jars open. Yeah. And that yeah. powder can be airborne. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I'm going to, I actually am kind of inspired. I think I'm going to take those classes. Oh, that's cool. Um, uh, actually, Kelly, what I want is a stay, va- a staycation. I want a week in my house with no responsibilities and I can take the t- these two classes. Remember, I want to take my color work class to really, Mm-hmm. Um, get really good at the knitting with a two-stranded knitting, um, <laughs> but I need a staycation. Uh, well, or you I can just everyone else in your life to go on vacation. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> because I can't imagine the rest of the people in your life letting you have that. <laughs> um, I may have mentioned this before. I never remember what I said in the podcast, but I had a. Uh, cousin who passed away but he uh i always say Otto, you know if you could go anywhere in the world on vacation where would you go and he'd say kansas city and i said to him well why kansas city he says because i don't know anybody in kansas city <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> so anyway i would like to just uh yeah anyway okay that's off topic though about dying <laughs> So um, that's I, I don't know what else do we want to add about dying. Um, I, I I guess the only thing I would add to it is just it's it's probably one of the most fun things I can think of to do. And whenever I die, I lose I completely lose track of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get so involved in it, and it's so much fun. And and the more you die, I think the more I, the more creative you can get. Yeah, um, you get past that notion of this is how I first started out. Like, oh, the first time I died, something's like I have to make it perfect, and I realized that that's that sometimes the the most creative and unusual colors and and techniques is like if you just um, and that's true of all art is just don't try and make it perfect. Right. It will be beautiful no matter what ha- yeah. however it turns out. Yeah, you will like it or someone will like it. Experiment. And, um, yeah. 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 Well, and uh, just thinking about Easter coming up and Easter egg dies, one of mm-hmm. the things, two two things about that. One, I think, just like over dyeing natural colored yarn, the like browns and gray yarns, I I really think that's pretty. Mm-hmm. Um, over if you if you dye eggs that are not white, mm-hmm. so brown eggs, or like we have eggs from one of our chickens that are that are actually blue, kind of a blue-green color. But dyeing, if you dye brown eggs, you get a sense of what happens when you use dye on the natural colored yarn, the, mm-hmm. the grays and browns um, that are out there, and it's beautiful. So, yeah. so I would recommend that. But also, don't dump the rest of your Easter egg dye out. Go get mm-hmm. a skein of yarn, put it in a Pyrex, 
pour the Easter egg dye over it, stick it in the microwave, um, and and use them to dye dye some yarn. You, the mm-hmm. colors are the colors are Easter eggy, but mm-hmm. it's just fun. It's yeah. a lot of fun to yeah. use that to use that Easter egg dye. Well, in fact, the first dyeing we did together was with the Easter egg dyes. Oh yeah, you, a long well, time ago, also, right? A long time ago, mm-hmm. and it was uh, it was so long ago that Ben was little, yeah. and then we spun, we dyed the fiber, a whole bunch of fiber, and some of the fiber we spun into yarn, I think. Yeah. And then you remember, and then he wove a little uh, pouch. You showed him how to weave a little pouch. I still have the little pouch that oh he my gosh wove. Okay, yeah. Or we, I think we wove it, yeah, and then. Yeah. Um, and then also, do you remember we um, used the Easter egg dye on uh, fiber, and then we felted slippers? Because mm-hmm. remember, we had Ben sitting on the counter with his feet in, in the, the um, in the in the kitchen sink, and then rubbing his feet to try and get these slippers to felt. Uh, okay, yeah, that was again funny. off topic, but it was it was that was Easter egg dyes. Yeah, mm-hmm. I hope that's enough. Yeah. Any, if anybody wants any more information, I guess uh, there's the internet. That's right. But, That's uh, right. And if yeah. you try something, post it. I'd like to see what you yeah. what you dye. Yeah. I think, uh, as I say, I think dyeing is one of the most satisfying and fun things you can do in yeah. fiber arts. I love the knitting, but the dyeing part is just... In fact, I'm so inspired. At, I think, well, I don't have time today, but tomorrow maybe I'll, I'll dye your technique where you're talking about the pale color. And then oh, uh-huh. I might try that. Um, yeah, it's fun, yeah. And, and it's fun to think about like uh, coordinating skeins, you know, mm-hmm. skeins that will go together. What would they, would they? What would you put on them to make them go together? So yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So we have one other thing that I need to make sure we we talk about, Marsha. Do you remember when we were at Stitches, and we talked to the women at the Twenty Stitches booth? Yes. So. 20 Stitches is a company that makes note cards that have pre-punched holes in them and then you get a you, you can buy the note cards already made or you can buy a kit with mm-hmm. the thread um, that goes basically stitches the little design into the note cards. So we were looking in her booth for something to purchase for a prize and she actually gave us a um, a set to give out mm-hmm. as a prize. So yeah, um, we wanted to to do that. So let me just um, I'm going to just read something from the website. It says clear instructions, pre-cut and perfectly spaced embroidery holes, a number 20 chenille needle and all the necessary thread and adhesives are included in our kits, making it easy to create perfectly embroidered note cards, tags and gift boxes. Our book arts inspired samplers are a fun way to practice or learn 20 embroidery stitches. We have these for a giveaway and yeah. we're going to open up. Uh, giveaway thread and uh, what I'd like for people to do I'll put a little prompt in the Ravelry thread for people to go and take a look at her website the 20 stitches uh, website look through her items and come back and tell us in the uh, in the Ravelry thread come back and tell us what product you like the best Um, her website is 20 stitches.com and we're going to have this thread open until May 8th. So uh, so go ahead and, and mm-hmm. go to the Ravelry thread, take a look at her website, and let us know. And we have the giveaway is for a kit. Yeah. And it's an embroidered note card kit. Yeah, they're really cute cards, I think. It's got four different designs. Yeah. Um, four different designs of note cards. And they're in a blue and orange and gray. They're very cute. It kind of reminds me of the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that yeah. Turquoise water and the orange of the Golden Gate Bridge. So, so yeah. Thank you, 20 Stitches, for the, for the giveaway. Yeah. So our next episode, Marsha, uh, will be a little bit early because of the knockers retreat that we're going to be going to. Yes. So we would nor- our knockers retreat that weekend is when we would normally be releasing the, an episode. And uh, but because of, of traveling to California and your schedule, we're actually going to record uh, a week early. So the pod, our next episode will come out early, and then after the knockers retreat, we'll go back to our regular scheduled programming. 
<laughs> time. Yeah, and it'll be an episode. Um, well, we'll have some patterns to review. I've been looking through the the pattern bundle in the Solidarity Swap, mm -hmm. so designers of color, and I found quite a few patterns that I'm that I'm interested in sharing. And so um, we'll be sharing some patterns from that, letting people know, you know, what we've seen in there in that bundle that we think is interesting. And then um, also talking about weaving mm -hmm. and the winter weave along will be over and uh, we'll be pulling prizes for that one yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. Do we have anything else we need to talk about? Oh, I know. I wanted to ask you bees. Oh, Bee yeah. update. So two weekends ago when it was really nice, the weekend that made me say I can't uh, complain about the weather mm -hmm. anymore. <laughs> Stop being a bore complaining about the weather because it was a really nice weekend and I was able to get into my hives mm -hmm. and I split them. So I have two hives or I had two colonies and I found the queen. Very first uh, box I opened, I found the queen. So I moved her into a new box, put in some food and, you know, some other frames of bees. So she had enough bees to keep her fed and enough food to, you know, for all of them to be able to eat. Um, and so, the, and then some empty uh, frames so that she had room to lay. And then I left the other box queenless. And at this point, they should have a capped queen cell. I haven't been in there to look because it's been rainy. But they should have a capped queen cell. And she should be, the new queen should be emerging by, I think, the end of the month. Okay. So yeah. when you take their queen, then they just go, oh, we need to make a new queen. So they, and then. About three days is when the egg, is when an egg hatches to become a larva. Mm -hmm. And then they take that brand new larva and they just feed it extra uh, royal jelly and just take extra good care of it. And they actually build that cell out to be a bigger, larger cell, kind of the shape of a peanut. Mm -hmm and keep feeding and feeding and feeding and that's what makes a queen bee. okay and then the one that is uh has now the queen and a few bees they realize that's our i mean that was their queen anyway right right and so so they're just they now are like oh we just have to build up our our uh, our empire again yeah mm -hmm. our colony okay so they just continue i gave her more room she's probably laid um the hive is now growing okay. Um, but I gave her the smallest and left the most resources with the hive that has to make a, okay. a whole new queen. So, and I did that with both my hives. The first hive, it was great because I found the queen and I was able to, you know, know which box had the queen in it, make sure I, you know, she had enough resources, but that I left the bulk of the resources with the hive that mm -hmm. needed to make a queen. In the other one, I did not find the queen. By the time I got through the first box and hadn't found the queen, they were getting a little tired of me. And I try not to keep mm -hmm. them open too long. And I, so I try to be respectful. When, and, of course, this is why I haven't been stung a lot in, you know, in beekeeping, is that when they start to get irritated and you know, bump at my veil and stuff, I... And I'm, and I'm mm -hmm. buzzing my head. I kind and of take go, and go, okay, <laughs> I'll finish up. Unless there's something I mm -hmm. really have to do, like I'm like, okay, this is time for me to finish up. So at that point I thought, okay, well, I'll just do what they call a, they call it a walk away split where you don't know where the queen is. You just know you split the hive into two and one of them has a queen, the other one doesn't. And the one that doesn't has half the resources of the hive so they can make a new queen from that. Okay. So that's what I did. And they seem to be, I, I think I can tell now which one of them has the queen in it because that's the one where pollen is coming in because they have brood to feed mm -hmm. with the pollen. Whereas the one that doesn't have the queen in it, right now there's nothing to feed. You know, they've okay. fed the queen already. They've capped her cell. Um, she's now, you know incubating, I guess is the best way to say it, mm -hmm. until she emerges. And so all they're doing now is bringing in nectar okay, and waiting for the queen to be 
to emerge from her cell. Mm -hmm. So I think I can tell which hive that is. One of them is bringing in a lot of pollen. So I'm pretty sure that's the one with the laying queen in it. And the other one is the hive that's making a new queen. Mm -hmm. So okay. if all goes well, they'll emerge the end of the month, beginning of April, right around there. They'll go out and get mated and then they'll come back and start laying. So if all goes well, I'll have four colonies. Okay. Let's all keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like propagating plants. You know, you, if, I'll be happy if one of them, if one of them works. Mm -hmm. I'll be really happy if both of them work, but you mm -hmm. know, you can only ask for so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I just have a little quick up update on Enzo and agility. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I went to agility class last Friday with him and usually there's a spot for six people, but usually, you know, on a, a noon on a Friday, it's usually just two or three of us. Um, last Friday, it was just me and Enzo just, and I'm, <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was like, almost like a private lesson. Yeah. But what I didn't realize is that when you have, it didn't occur to me is that when you have other dogs there, you get a break from running. Oh. So I ran for <laughs> 40 minutes and finally um Cheryl the uh trainer said, "Yeah, you want to just take a break." <laughs> so she played with Enzo for a while and I realized I need to get a little uh cardio in if I'm going to do agility. So I uh, so now what I've been doing when I take him out for a walk, we walk and then we run a little bit. And I Kelly, you know me, I am not a runner. I am just I am not a runner. Mm -hmm. So, but I thought, you know, That's I just, good. Have, I, so I just sort of, I, you know, I just pick up the pace and kind of jog a little bit, walk, mm -hmm. jog a little bit just to build up a little stamina. Cause I realized the, after going down to the dog show in, which I don't know if I talked about that or not, but then going to the dog show and watching the agility, it's a big course, mm -hmm. way bigger than what we're doing. And so I have to improve, um, the cardio <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so lesson learned but anyway all right yeah and the funny thing is my brother showed up that was the day he decided to come and watch and i said so how did en i said what do you think how'd enzo do and he goes oh he did great and i said how'd i do he said um you were okay <laughs> <laughs> because as i've said it's the whole all the dog training stuff all of this it's not really about the dog it's about yeah. me so any mistakes that are made it's really on me so um <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of funny. And of course, and of course, a brother or sister will tell you that. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think somebody, and I, I'm going to say I'm the same way. And too, before I actually started watching all this, like, why are they, like, it's so obvious what they're doing that's wrong. Why don't they mm -hmm. just stop doing it? But when you're actually doing it, it's really, I've said this before, it's super hard to remember where your feet are, where the jumps are, where your dog is. How am I yeah. supposed to turn? Is it I'm crossing in front? Am I crossing in back? Uh, there's a lot to remember. It's a lot so, to remember, yeah. Yeah, so um, until someone's actually done it, it's um, it's easy to be <laughs> critical. You know? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. So, okay, Um I don't think we have anything else, do we? I have a recommendation. Um, so just a quick one, thinking about the bees in the yard this, this week and last week, um, the Xerces Society has a pollinator-friendly plant list. It's xerces.org, X-E-R-C-E-S dot O-R-G. And they have a bunch of things on their website. I highly recommend it, but I'll link to their a pollinator conservation plant list and they have them by state or region so depending on where you are but it gives you a good list of plants if you're interested in providing forage for pollinators and not just not just honeybees but bumblebees and other wasps and other small things that insects that pollinate so okay. it's, a, it's a pretty good pretty good uh, site with lots of plant lists for lots of different parts of the US so I will link to that. And I imagine that if you're not in the U.S., there's a, a similar kind, there are similar kinds of websites um, out there. But this Xerces Society website is a really, a really nice one. It's X-E-R-C-E-S dot O-R-G. Okay. So it's my recommendation for the week. All right, great. Because I have to put some new plants in, so I'll check out the list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Get bee friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, Marcia. Is that it then? I That's think we it. covered everything. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So we'll talk actually in just a week. Yes. Not long. Alrighty. At all.
Okay. okay. Alrighty. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit 2usefiberadventures.com. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the 2us doing, doing our, our part, part for, for World Fleece. Fleece.